part of the problem with having people, you know, who are like yourself, who you're, you know, you're a practicing medical professional. You can, you can diagnose people, you're licensed to practice physical medicine, right? So you can, you can actually have a physical effect on people's lives, but you can't talk about it in your experience and your thoughts on these tech platforms, you know, YouTube we're talking about specifically. So it's, I've always thought that that's very odd that there's, there's the ability to maintain a license in the United States of America and have a physical effect on someone's life. Like you, you're holding their life in your hands, you know, you could prescribe them this and you could have this kind of effect. You can do that and you have the license to do that, but you can't talk on YouTube that I just have always it's thought a very interesting weird. point. And it's almost so obvious that it's striking because it's never really mentioned. And it points to the underlying philosophical issue again, without going into specific examples, which is that doctors treating patients, individual patients privately are not really the concern of the people who are after you. The concern is a doctor having influence over society through his ideas. In other words, the doctor's idea, the doctor's speech and language is really what is, in their view, dangerous. It's not actually killing people or harming them or exercising malpractice, which is what they say is the problem. What the real problem is, is the threat to ideas and thoughts and thinking and behavior and ultimately the weakening of the coercive influence of that group over the population because their end game has been is and always will be not safety protection and truth but actually power control and compliance okay so yeah let's let's talk about then what is the biggest difference between united states of fear which was the book we were discussing that YouTube went back in time. I should just remind everybody that we talked in November of 2021. And then in August of 2022, they struck my video. My, my tinfoil hat idea is that it may not have been that video at all, that there was something I had uploaded recently. I did one about how they have this, uh, this new pressure from the government threatening over posts about law enforcement. So that's the new thing. You know, like you were saying, there's always a new thing to be afraid of. And so there's pressure from the government constantly. Was it that video that triggered something? And then they just go back in time. You know, I, I, I don't know. It's I mean, hard it just to seems know. very odd. It's very hard to know because you're never really told the truth. Yeah. And that's, that's if you were the told process. the truth, then you'd be able to engage and debate and then they would end up looking like fools. So they'll, they'll throw out an excuse, a rationalization that sounds semi-plausible on the surface when the real reason is actually uh, completely different and is one that they simply cannot even defend superficially. And, and that's been the, the game that's been played for a lot of people that are um, professional media. I'm, I'm a professional doctor, but I, I obviously work with people in media to discuss and express my opinions. But those who actually send out the message, I've heard this story from a lot of people that I know who have been saying things that I thought, huh, that should have gotten them banned for a long time. Then suddenly they say something rather innocuous and they get a message saying, you said this innocuous thing and you're gonna get banned completely. Forget it, your life is over. And they're thinking, what? Why did you wait a year? So it's not that, it's really not. It's, yeah, it just it just seems odd. I, I don't know. But like you said, I mean, part of the 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 I think the strategy is the confusion in all of it. And that because it in, encourages self-censorship, which, of course, I do on YouTube. Right. Because there's no to me, there's I tried the other way. OK, I tried the sort of like headstrong. Mm. I'm going to say what I want to talk to who I want. And I realized that I'm just not going to beat them at their own game. So I have to, I have to create my own game and then use them in my game. Like that's, that's the way that I look at it. And so we were talking before about how a lot of people go, well, you should just totally get off of YouTube. Well, YouTube's the second, if not the, you know, since it basically is Google, which is the most popular search engine in the world. So YouTube's number two, but they're essentially the same. It, it, you lose an entire swath of the population who hasn't, you know, gotten to the other side yet. And it's a bridge to, to just say, hey, this information out there, there are doctors out there who are asking these questions. Just we just can't talk about them here. And then, you know, it also shows that like we can't talk about it here. So the, the reason you may not have heard about this, you may, this, it's not because it doesn't exist. It's because you're not allowed to talk about it. And then that should also signal to people that there's something going on here that they should be 
at least paying attention to. So, so tell me, uh, between your first book, United States of Fear, and your new book, Freedom from Fear, A 12-Step Guide to Personal and National Recovery, which I love because I don't know if you knew this, but I, what, I did originally go to grad school for um, uh, drug addiction counseling. So <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what's the big change here and why did you decide to write the second book? So there's a couple of shifts that I made since November, the publication date of my first book, United States of Fear. And one is getting away from a top-down approach as a solution to this problem. I originally felt, as many Americans did, that we needed a change at the top. We needed a change in Washington. We needed a change in political, corporate leadership, media leadership. I, I do still think we have to make that change, but I don't think we can start from that point and go down. Uh, I think that that has been proven to be a failure. We uh, largely lost uh, an election uh, two years ago on multiple levels at the Washington level uh, for various reasons. Uh, and I think that a lot of people pin their hopes on the national leadership shifting, and it, it just didn't. On the other hand, local leadership is rapidly changing across the country. It started in Virginia, then moved to San Francisco, now most recently in Florida, with the uh, complete trouncing of the uh, left-wing uh, trans activist school board, boards, plural, uh, and putting in actual parents who have children in the school who are invested in basic safety, education, truth, you know, non no, really non-political, non-partisan issues, just basic American family values. And I think that if we, from both a political point of view and also a personal point of view, which is what the second book is about, it's not about the nation as a whole, it's about individuals, move towards improving ourselves as people, as individuals, and then making a difference in our own lives, the lives of our families, our communities, our cities, our counties, our states, et cetera, similar to the way that both Judeo-Christian religion and the 12-step program, which is most frequently referred in, in Alcoholics Anonymous and represented there, if we start from there, then I think we have a chance of building up. So I wrote the second book really to reorient the population away from giving the responsibility to that other guy over there and bringing it back to the self and saying, we need to do it ourselves as individuals and then grow and grow and grow and take back our country. Okay. Well, since we're on 12 steps, I guess this would probably be a good time to promote my wine sponsor, huh, Dr. McDonald? <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, everybody, you can support my work by getting 50% off some amazing Malbecs from Argentina and 50% off shipping. Um, summer is almost over. And if you want to try, these are great pairings for grilling season. Uh, They're all high altitude and from very remote regions. They come with very unique flavors. And uh, like I said, from very small, in some cases, one, one they handpick the grapes, the Rogue Malbec. So what better to drink in honor of my channel than the Rogue Malbec? Uh, but one from almost 9,000 feet, it's a really, really good extreme altitude Malbec. And then this one over here, the Gaucho Malbec, they use natural fermentation. So like I said, can't get them at the grocery store. Why would you want to? You can support my work. Uh, these are wines that I drink when I'm not eight months pregnant. And thank you, everybody who watched our gender reveal last night. Dr. McDonald, we're having a boy next month. Wow, so we're very excited. I had no idea. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. That's fantastic. Um, and I love Argentine so Malbecs. It's one of my favorite wines. Uh, oh, good. Great value for the, the quality and the price. I almost I'm almost exclusively buy that kind of wine when I want to buy red wine. And, and oh, really? I am not being paid to say this at all. I, I just <laughs> this is actually completely honest. <laughs> yeah, no, I did not. I did not pay Dr. McDonald. <laughs> no, she did not um, pay me to say and that. He's not using his his psych psychiatry voodoo on you or anything. Like that, <laughs> being honest. <laughs> Anyway, but no, I, I mean, I really like them too. And, uh, it's actually a really good deal. I think if you didn't, if you didn't buy them through Alice in wine promo or you're getting them somewhere else, they would be really expensive wines, but they're there. And I don't, I don't do like very expensive wines. I won't spend money on them, but I, I do like, um, like you were saying, Malbec's have a great flavor without having to spend the Pinot Noir price. You know what I mean? That's right. So I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, anyway, but yeah, if you if you like coffee, you can also support my work over at TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Allison. These are USDA certified organic roasts. They have uh, light roasts and dark roasts. There's a limited black edition right now, which is really good. Um, I like they have espresso. I like the cigar number one is good. It's a dark roast. I drink it most days. And um, there's also Katura tea if you like tea. I'm making tea for my kombucha. It tastes like, <clears throat> excuse me, it tastes like black tea. I cold brew mine 24 hours. Very good. So uh, it's uh, the fruit around the coffee bean. 
And uh, like I said, it's, it's a lot like a black tea. It's very good. So twininginecoffee.com slash Allison. Also high altitude and USDA certified organic. Okay, so let's go back to... Um, Let's go back to the topic at hand before we got the stream on YouTube. Um, they changed their terms of service. And I, I mean, it comes after the CDC sort of, I guess, in some ways relaxed some of its policy. I guess if you see it that way, you know, I think everybody has a different opinion about what exactly happened when the CDC said certain things like for, you know, transmission prevention policy. Now we're going to look at vaccinated people the same as the unvaccinated. That was one, one of their new recommendations. Um, but maybe, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe it is a direct tie with the government pressure. We've seen that before. So they decided they were going to relax it. Or is there just something new that we're going to all start worrying about? And that's why they don't care. What do you think? My belief has been from the beginning, and this really hasn't changed. And I said this I mean, as early as probably July of 2020 in Washington, D.C., with America's Frontline Doctors Group and Dr. Simone Gold, uh, who is now actually a political prisoner in a federal prison in Florida for 90 days for being escorted into the rotunda of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, speaking briefly and then freely and nonviolently walking out. I said that this pandemic is not a medical pandemic. It is a pandemic based on fear. And the end goal is not fear, just like the end goal of this viral pandemic is not to have people killed or saved or what have you, or treated or not treated. The end goal is to indoctrinate and inculcate a culture of fear, palpable fear into every single American so that those Americans who are, thou, who are now fearful can no longer think for themselves, will become more compliant, and will accept absolutely ridiculous, irrational dictates that they never would have even considered three to five years prior. And of course, I can go through a whole list of them from the last couple of years, starting with the school closures, and then the masks, and then the shots, and now mm -hmm. moving forward into things that are equally ridiculous, like the boy that you're going to have, what if he starts to put on um, a pair of your high-heeled shoes uh, at age two or three or four. And he says, you know, mommy, I kind of like looking like uh, Julie. And you say, you know what? You're probably a little girl. Let's take you to the clinic and uh, let's, let's begin a, a therapeutic supervision of your gender journey. No parent would have thought that this was normal even three or four years ago. Now they're being told not only is it normal, but if you don't, your little boy will probably commit suicide by the time he's 12 years old, and then you will be responsible. And people are just nodding their heads saying, yes, 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 that makes perfect sense. I'm so scared. I don't want to lose my child. I'll do whatever you say. This is morphing into something that no one at the top that is leading this charge, that is pulling these strings, could have ever possibly envisioned five or 10 years ago. They thought they could do this in 40 or 50 years. We have been catapulted forward to a state of society now that has a degree of control, which is largely led by media. If media weren't present, we would not have been able to have this achievement, if you wanna call it a dubious achievement. But because of the influence of media and the opportuni opportunity of this Wuhan virus fear pandemic, we have jumped forward 40, 50 years into a contemporary Soviet state. Okay, well, on that note, <laughs> I think we could transition over to YouTube. Uh, any final thoughts, or not over to YouTube, off of YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, we are live on Rumble and Rockfin, and then it'll be up on Odyssey and my locals page too. And I should say also, I take I take questions from folks on my locals community. So if you're over there, you get to put questions in ahead of time for interviews like Dr. McDonald. It's a great way to um, support my work and then also go direct with some of the most censored people on the internet. And it's uh, I like it because it's not so much a top-down model. It's a, it's a way for you to you to sort of uh, be engaged in the news yourself. Cause if there are questions you have, you can ask yourself, you don't have to rely on somebody like me to dish it out for you. So go to alisamaro.locals.com and sign up there. Um, I guess any final thoughts for the YouTube audience before we go, Dr. McDonald? Well, my final thought, which I speak to just about every audience about is the following. You may not be a fearful person yourself. You may not be somebody who is compliant, who is a part of the problem. However, you probably do know someone who is. And many people ask me, what do I do for those people? How do I change minds? And now I have a book out, Freedom from Fear, that explains that in a 12-step program. The point, though, whether or not you buy the book is not, is not the point. The point is that Americans today have to, must, absolutely must, acknowledge 
that they have a fear addiction. And if they do not acknowledge this addiction, they will never be able to move forward from it. And if we don't move forward from it, our country is basically over. This sounds very dire, but I think this is my main message that I'm trying to get across now, that we got to get way beyond fighting little battles and skirmishes and see what the bigger war is. And the bigger war is a war between dependence and independence. And dependence or dependency is being fueled and furthered and ensconced through ongoing fear. That is my belief as a psychiatrist, as a clinician, and also as a social uh, observer. You brought up the media. Oh, where'd you go? You brought up the media, and I, I meant to follow up with one question before we leave YouTube, too, about that. Um, since that's my my background, having worked in TV news, and you're a psychiatrist, what's your read on why the average reporter went along so willingly with a lot of these narratives without asking questions, thinking that, um, you know, they were still doing their public service as a journalist by promoting government talking points, for instance, uh, versus questioning. And then also amping up the calls for censorship and any psychological breakdown on the journalists who are participating in that? Well, you probably know the answer to this question, or at least believe you know the answer. I believe I know the answer, which is the journalistic profession is over. It's dead. I just spoke with a woman yesterday after I met with her husband, who's a priest uh, at a church in Orange County. And she was approached by the Epoch Times, a, a large newspaper organization in Southern California and also nationally online. They also print editions in order to assist in recruiting journalists for the paper. The local manager of the state of California Epoch Times said to her, we really have trouble finding journalists. We have great content. We just don't know how to get people to write it. She said, that should be easy. I'll go find them for you. He said, it's not so easy. She said, I was appalled. I interviewed dozens of people, people who had graduated from journalism school. And what I found was the following. Each one of them said to me the same thing. When I told her what we were trying to do, we we're trying to get an idea, a theme, go out and gather information and present a story. They said, what? The way that I was taught is, I have an opinion, a belief, a conclusion. I go out and find evidence to support that predetermined opinion, conclusion, or belief. And then I put the story out. And she said, you have it backwards. That's not journalism. And they said, yes, it is. Every single one told her this. This is the reason. The ideas, the conclusions have already been reached. You know, the, 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 <laughs> the future is known. The past is what's always changing. So journalists have adopted that Soviet mentality. We already know the answer. We just have to go and find a way to prove and support what we already believe to be the, 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 the reality in the case. And I think that is, is to a large degree why we have non-journalist journalists. The, the second piece of that, of course, is extortion, compliance, threat, censorship, which is very easy to accomplish when a lot of journalists fall under the, 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 this tiny little umbrella and they're all being employed by the same companies. There's really not as much competition or freedom of movement. Similar problem with the entertainment industry. And there's also a lot of people that want to be journalists, competition market and so on. But I, I think that that is one of the biggest problems is that they're just not being taught. And then the ones that, that do want to be journalists are being pressured to leave and being pressured to lie. The final point I want to make is I didn't see this in Europe. I just spent six weeks in the Balkans touring five of the seven former Yugoslav republics, now republics, Yugoslav country, former now, now, now republics. And I didn't see this there. And I asked myself, why is that? What, why is media and journalism so different? And I think one of the reasons comes to my second point, which is that in Europe, there is far, far less censorship. There is not as much monopolistic power in the journalism media community as there is in the United States. Now we do have more outliers. We do have AM radio, for example. There's no radio, AM radio in Europe. So we do have more diversity at the edges than Europe does, but we also have far more censorship. So the edges don't have as much power because they get crushed. You just talked about Ben Shapiro in the Daily Wire recently and how he's being attacked and crushed. Why is it because of his opinions? Well, yes, but mostly because he is trouncing the competition in his media downloads five, 10 times that of CNN and NBC and MSNBC. So they, they, they feel that they're losing and they are losing viewership and listenership to certain outliers. And so they're going after them. That doesn't happen in Europe. You don't have that degree of censorship. People are still allowed to speak and talk freely, even if it's in a more narrow, uh, confined space. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that um, the average journalist would recognize that Ben Shapiro or others like him have large followings 
but in their brains, they would say, it's not that we're just, we're upset that we're losing to him and we're jealous. It's that we feel he has a significantly dangerous ideology that we're losing people to that. That's how in their brains they would do the gymnastics so that, you know, it still feels like, no, because if they had to admit that they were just jealous, then that would make them catty, superficial, non-journalists in their brains. But if they could say, no, the reason why we care is just because we don't want all these people following this guy because they're all being misled. You need to watch us so they won't be misled. You know, we don't ever spread disinformation or have any <laughs> mistakes in our in our news reporting. So, and if we do, it's just a mistake. That's what I was saying in that Ben Shapiro video is that often in the mainstream world, in the corporate world, if, if there's a mistake made... They don't go look at each other and say, see the problem we have in corporate news. But if somebody says something outside of the corporate news model, then they go, see the problem in alternative news. Like there's this there's this grandiose thematic pattern outside when a mistake is made or somebody says something that diverges from the establishment narrative. But when they do it, you know, it's just a mistake. They just have to put an editor's note People make mistakes. So it's just an interesting way of looking at it. Okay. Thank you everybody for watching on YouTube. We'll see you on Rumble and Rockfin. Like I said, it'll be up on Odyssey later and join my locals community, alisamaro.locals.com.